Ricardo, are you okay admitting everyone in? No. Yeah, yeah I'm fine. Cool. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us in a timely fashion. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Bill Bailey, uh, one of my former coaches, uh, to deliver a webinar for us today on the tactical considerations for free free defence. Um, as usual, the video, uh, the webinar will be recorded and the video link will be sent out. Uh, use the chat box for questions, although there'll be opportunities to ask questions, use the raise hand function as, as normal and, and at the end. Um, as previously mentioned, we've had some security issues in the past, so if you notice anything um, unusual on your, uh, on your device that you're using, uh, please exit the meeting. Um, we'll do our best to abort the meeting if, if we do get hacked, but we've taken the necessary precautions to uh, make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, please keep your microphone on mute. And that is it from me. So, uh, Bill, do you want to go on to a bit of an introduction about yourself and then progress with the presentation, mate? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, just for the people that don't know me, uh, you know, I've been working in British handball for over 30 years now. Uh, my original background is with a team from Glasgow, uh, Trist uh, 77. Oh. I'm one of the former uh, members of that club. Um, it's where I started my playing career. Uh, in 1987, I moved to Manchester. Um, and took over the reins at Salford Handball Club, which eventually merged and became Warrington Wolves Handball Club. Uh, I'm currently involved in coaching the under-19 under Great Britain women's team. I've been involved with that set up for approaching three years now. Um, and I'm currently also working with the under-19 girls at the Warrington Wolves Club. Uh, with a number of uh, national team jobs, uh, but probably my, you no, know, the one that means the most to me was my involvement in London 2012 uh, as assistant coach to the GB men's squad. And also the talent development program, Sport and Giants, where I had the pleasure of meeting Bobby White uh, all those years ago. So um, his introduction to handball is probably down to maybe it our good talent spotting or maybe not so good <laughs> one way or the other we got them involved Thank you. Uh, okay um i've been asked to cover uh, just a little bit about the background of you no know, this 3-3 defense i was asked by bob to cover it about a month ago and uh although it's not a defense that i use on a regular basis it's not to say that i haven't used it so the presentation is going to be based on uh, my understanding, a little bit of research I've done on it, uh, why people would possibly use the defence. Um, but essentially, it is an ideal defence, I do believe, for teaching young players defence. You know, a 3-3 three, three system, it's like two banks of defenders, a front row and a back row. Um, it teaches the early parts about cooperation, you know, and uh, also defending one against one. So I'm going to, there's two presentations here. Uh, one is a little bit about how I feel 3-3 three, three, three works, what the responsibilities are, what we should be looking at in the training method. And then the second presentation is a little bit around, um, you know, how we can help young players make better decisions when they're learning defensive uh, skill. Because, you know, I'm sure a number of people down here, there's a not, not a great deal of, or a high percentage of training goes necessarily towards skill training for defence. So if you just bear with me when I get this screen up. Okay, can, can we all see that? Yeah, all good. Okay, right, this is just uh, kind of considerations for this defensive system. Um, you know, the framework for, uh, what I've tried to do with the PowerPoint is that, you know, you won't get any di diagrams or any videos because uh, sometimes, you know, with these kind of presentations, it lags a bit. You know, people from further afield struggle a little bit. But what I have tried to do is pack it with as much information as I can. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have some time during the presentation to answer some questions. Uh, thought, are you dealing with that, Ricardo? Yes, yes, yeah. we're we'll landing on okay. that. Okay, I think um, no, during the first introduction stage, you can see it's, uh, I think it's vital to teach the skills in the defence again, one against one, okay? And when I say one against one, 
it's the kind of traditional part of the defence where if we take, for instance, a left-back approach in the goal, the player would move up to that player, uh, put pressure on, you know, on the left-back's right arm, uh, try to guide them down to the weaker side, you know, a standard defence. But if you're going to play this kind of defensive system, then you have to relentlessly teach that skill within defence. Uh, if we don't have strong 1v1 defenders, particularly in the front positions, uh, you will you will find yourself in a lot of trouble. So I think one of the first things, if you do decide to go down this route, is you need to carefully consider how much time you're spending on that skill of uh, teaching 1v1 defence. Uh, moving on from that, when you've completed the stage of defence training, it's about expanding the tasks that are performed, and less space, progressing it towards the actual defensive concept. Um, there's more value gauge with, well, around the space where the attack can have more success. So now we're kind of looking at the reasons why we would want to play such a, de a defense, uh, because it is quite deep, but it is also very narrow. But it does put, uh, put the defensive formation within the, the attacking zones where attackers are possibly looking for greater success. Um, and then we, we then begin to place a bit of significance on the defensive space and the management of attackers. Um, uh, that, and it's a kind of new approach that allows them, you know, with their technical and tactical strategic skill. Um, if I just, uh, something's happened to my screen, just bear with me a minute. Better. Sorry about that. Um, and these kind of, and, and what will give your defensive qualities, you no, know, will be the work anticipation based on you no know, two points for me is the organisation of the players' actions, so how they collaborate. You know, so even though we're taught, I believe this is a, an excellent defence for teaching young young children up to the age of sixteen about learning uh, good defensive organisation skills, good defensive techniques. Um, it also gets good cooperation. Um, and then also, I think Scott Harrington in one of the previous presentations here about 3 two, one in fact, most of them, Ricardo did 4-2, and we had the presentation on 5-1 and the 6-1, is that everybody seemed to have the operating rules. What were the rules of that per particular defence? And this is particularly important with this kind of defence. Okay, there's a diagram there. You can see the the main element of it is there's two banks of three players. So if we're looking, we number six in this diagram had been much higher than the defense would actually look like a three, two, one. So, you, you know, again, you have to decide, is it three, two, one you want to play? Is it in an aggressive manner? Or is it strictly a three, three where, you know, the decision being made is that you have a bank of defenders approximately three defenders, six or seven metres, and another bank of three defenders beyond the nine metre line. Okay. Uh, work is on an individual and collective responsibility. A lot of people think that this defence, the three at the front, okay, you go and do your thing, and the three at the back will cover any mistakes. It's got to be a collective responsibility. Um, you know, it's, there's tactical discipline is really important in this defence uh, for it to be for it to operate the way you would like it to. Communication is a key figure with all defensive um, formations. Uh, and it also then the, how you communicate will depend on you know, the tactics for the matches, the decisions made prior to the game. That also affects communication. That needs to be communicated throughout uh, you know, the, the, the actual matches uh, or the communication means nothing. Um, the situation with the ball, uh, and your opponent, they matter throughout this defensive phase. So every time opponent is on possession of the ball, there has to be pressure on that player at all times with that. We can't be having a situation where the ball is way an opponent and then we don't have anybody who's taking care of that particular player within the ball. It often happens a lot with this defence, particularly with the wing defenders, the wide, the number two and the number four. Okay, and then acting on your opponent's space. You know, one of the key things, you know, I spoke at the beginning about uh, 
about the importance for me about teaching 1v1 defence, tackling. But for me, that it's not the big priority of all the defensive skills that we should be teaching young players. Okay, and one of them is about taking the initiative and closing paths. So we want to close the route to the goal by using their body. And they also want to close passing channels, look for chances to put a press on, to intercept passes, and be aware of where those particular channels are. Once they have that kind of knowledge, then this defence is ideal. It can set traps uh, quite easily. Uh, everybody still with me, yeah? Okay, and just for the considerations, generally, you know, the reduction of space where the ball is by increasing the amount of defenders in there, okay? So you can see that normally, I've kind of circled the players there. This is the area of responsibility, you know, for who's responsible for who and the space that they're also responsible for, okay? But this gives you no know, better density and there's little space between the defenders. So the defense is really, you know, they have to be in good shape here because all of the time this defense is in movement continually. Every time the ball is passed, there's a reaction. There has to be a reaction from the defense. And prioritization of defensive activity. Okay, the central zone, the high percentage shooting area is the area that we're trying to protect here if we're, if we're playing 3-3, three, three, maybe there's a perceived threat from the back court. Um, you know, there's also all the space from the pivot player. But the key to this defence is protecting that middle zone. So, like in most defences, there's a decision made, OK, there's going to be a shot against us, but where is that shot going to be allowed to come from? Particularly in this defence, it looks like, you know, it, the preference would be, if you're playing this system, that you're going to take some shots from the outside positions, from the, the wing positions or deep out in, the, out in the side positions. And then help, you know, which I think, oh, I see this a lot when I watch these defences when they first get formed. The young, young players don't realise the importance of helping. It's very much like, a, OK, it's a 3-3, but it's based also here we've got players circled and they view this like, OK, that's my man and I'm going to stay with that person. And that's my job. You know, this is a defence that you need to be always in the position to help. And the example on the picture, you can see that number two is really close with the ball being in the playmaker position is really close to number three. That way, they're allowed, if needed be, to help the number three with the pivot, but also give them that kind of uh, distance that they can cover the wing. And often, I always get asked this in the women's junior team, when I have the wing defenders, oh, where should I stand? You know, I'm getting caught and I'm leaving too much space for the wing. Every every player is different, and it's a thing that we need to consider as coaches. Do we have the players to play in those positions that have the speed to cover the position? If not, then that distance starts to get greater, and then the gamble of not being able to help gets greater and greater. But getting the, 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 getting the young players to understand that the two objectives are helping, they need to correct mistakes in marking. Okay, somebody mismarks a player, they have to be ready to help correct that. And same with retrieving the ball. Is, you know, if there's a foul, a small foul on the arm, the ball goes free. It's about everybody, you know, retrieving the ball collectively. And then the organisation at, at, at um, defensive threat to form a consistent block. Okay, main blocker, everybody think on a three to one defense, particularly maybe the number three. But here there's responsibility to be an offensive block for five, six, and seven, because what we're trying to do with this defense is deny that opportunity uh, for them to shoot close to the goal. So they can shoot from far out, but there needs to be that kind of pressure on the player. So that's about helping, making sure that if one player's tackling, can you help? Can you be a block behind that player? Okay, so basically the concept to be developed is a collective recovery of the ball. And I think that has to be you know, the main emphasis for anybody that's deciding to play this defence. If that is the understood concept to this defence, then all the other aspects of pressing, turning the ball over, stealing the ball, blocking the ball, all become a, a, you know, a higher up the priority list of the defensive skills than just being good one against one. 
Okay, basic rules of the defense. So we can see, you no, know, respect the positions, right? That's throughout the defensive phase. And what I mean there is, okay, when you're the wing defender, you do your job, you respect what your your job has to be. Then when that ball goes from your, your zone, you're still in a defensive phase. You've still got to understand, okay, can I now, if I'm the wing defender, can I be close enough to help the central defender with the pivot? Do I need to protect the space in behind the halfback? So there's that continual respect for what you're doing in your, your position. It's not just the one-on-one -on -one aspect of the defence. Uh, keep your attention on the ball and your direct opponent. So players all of the time. I remember one of the old coaches I used to work with said, when you, play def when you do defensive training, the, the part of your body that should tire first is your neck because you're constantly looking left and right, seeing where the ball is, seeing where your player is, and communicating that information. Enough of that is not played. Sometimes players play too square, where they can't even see the other side of the court. So again, if, by keeping attention on the ball and keeping attention on your direct opponent, the players are constantly observing the development of the attack. Position yourself on the shooting arm, closing the strong side always, even though you're far from the goal, uh, when you're in the front three, you need to be aware of that positioning, you know, the strength of that player and try to force them to always try and play down their weaker side. Okay, for a left back, you want them to go to the left side and, and vice versa for the right back. Playmaker, depending on left or right back, then you want to always force them on the weaker side. And control the distance of the mark in according to the game situation. So if... If you feel that you you need to pressure and harass the attackers, that will make that will impact the distance between you and the player you're marking. If you're looking to dispossess them, whether that be a steal or an intercepted pass, that will also control the distances that you need. And if you're looking to control the player's movement, then of course you need to be very very close to the attacking player there. So again, that that distance can't be you'll get often from young players. Right, how far should I go out or how, how do I need to come back? That will all depend on opponent and all depend on your tactical element. Right, and make sure there's a strict marking of the opponent with the ball. Certainly, and the activity always on the ball and the throwing arm. Okay, Too many times, particularly in the UK, we see a lot of tackles around players' waists. You know, I like kind of like a rugby-type tackle. And okay, that, no, so a lot of these young players have come from that background. I understand why that happens. But if, we, if you go back a couple of slides, you know, what we're trying to do with this defence is to regain the ball. So it doesn't make any sense to just tackle a player around the waist or around the chest. You want to be putting constant pressure on the ball and the throwing arm all of the time that, if you're going to operate with a defence like this. Uh, okay. Always prevent passes into the six meter line. <laughs> that goes for every single defense, but particularly here, there's a lot of space to be covered. Okay, but it's a, it's not about often they think right. Okay, I'll let them receive the ball or her receive the ball, and then I'll I'll take my chance one against one with them. Far better to win the ball with the pass. So no, the players need to learn about positioning and you no know, opening pot potential passes to the pivot where they have a, the defender has a chance to win the ball back. It's far, far better, particularly if you're up against modern pivot players who are quite tall, quite strong, then you'll always win the battle if you can win the ball. If they get the ball before you, then the chances are you may win the tussle or you may find yourself in a suspension and a seven metre. So better to always kind of teach them to try to protect the pass and any play on the six meter, whether it's the pivot or a second pivot who's come in a transition. Help colleagues when they require it. We talked about that before. And then have continuous and sustained rhythm of the defense. So this is all about its movement. The defense can't, there needs to be a reaction every time the ball is passed, you know, and then we adjust the types of skills needed to achieve that. So we're being adaptable all of the time. Sometimes the movement might need to be different to adapt to the situation. But this is a dynamic defense that won't operate and it won't work properly unless there's continuous and sustained rhythm in the movement of the defense. 
and it's organized based on the space and not the opponent. Always protect the space. The you know we sometimes get the problem. Okay, the winger, the left winger decides to run in like second pivot. Should I run with him, coach? Should I stay here? What do you want me to do? The best thing is right. You have to protect the space. Each player on the court has space to protect. And you no, know, if the back court player makes the run to the second pivot, there's no need to protect the space out there because the player that you're marking effectively now is behind you so they can run back with that player but on the wing transition it's not necessary for them to run all the way across but there needs to be that direct communication but the key thing here is the players are looking to try and protect the space that's in front of them Okay, to finish form the zone of defence, we need to find the following aspects. The structure of the defence on the court. Okay, that's run about standards of activity on the court, the match system, and the standard organisation of individual defensive action. So this is a kind of tactical element of how you're going to set the structure up for that defence um, and the, you know, the activity of the, the attacking team that you're expecting. Okay, the system that they may play, do they play with two pivots? Can they tr play in transition? Where is the threat from? And then the, the individual organization for individual defensive action. So particular players may need another particular type of defensive action against them. And we'll pick up on th those aspects a little bit later in the presentation. And variations of the system against opponents. So principles marking, right? Who are we marking? Are the who are the dangers? Uh, relating to how are the actions link, you know, well, we need support there. Do they need help there? Okay, you know, where is the danger coming from? You know, all of those aspects will, will, will link the actions together. Sometimes help might be, okay, we can double team that player uh, at some particular point or phase in the game. So that's how we would link those actions together. And then defensive collaboration, front three setting a trap up. Okay, back three, reducing pivot space are just a couple of examples of what that defensive collaboration is. You know, and that's really for you as coaches to decide how you want that particular defense to work. But remember about the adaptability. It can't be the same form of defense against every single opponent because they all, they all come with different concepts and different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and then the last part there, responsibility for each player within their specific position. Again, I'll pick up on that at the end of the presentation. The base position to enable you to intervene at the right time. So players have to be thinking before the ball gets there, okay, what's going to happen in the next two, three seconds? Uh, mastery of different movements, okay? When the player's on the ball, am I looking to steal the ball from them? Am I setting myself up for a duel against this player? Do I need to show my 1v1 strengths? And then intervent, interventions in specific adjoining positions. So that's after the ball's gone. Okay, where where do I need to be next? Where can I be where I can help? Do I need to move? You know, I certainly need to move, but where am I moving to? Okay, so has anybody got any questions while I put the next uh, screen up? There's nothing in the chat, mate, so far. But... Yet, no. Right, good. Okay. Uh, let me just. Oh. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, all good. Okay, um, so I've kind of that was a bit of research that I've done about my belief on a three-three defense. I have used it on occasion, but it's not my go-to defense. And 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 in all honesty, I don't see it operating in that form uh, at any kind of senior game. But no, as as pointed out, I think it is a a, a great defense for youth handball, particularly. 
you know, 14 year old upwards, 13, 14 up to 16. Uh, I think it promotes you no know, good defensive skill and gives lots of opportunities to develop the 1v1 skills, the movement, all the things that incorporate the defensive skills. Uh, right, let me just start this. Okay, in this introduction, um, I'm, I'm going to try and get through you no know, organizational stuff and how the elements of this defense are built up and what we can work on to develop the different moments in the defense. Okay, what kind of mental and physical basics are needed for a good defense? Uh, what what is skill in defence? You know, often you know there's a whole raft of stuff there that's missed out. Normally, people think skill in defence is tackling, and uh, that there's a whole lot of different skills that are essential to create and develop good defensive players. And three three at young age categories is a, is a great opportunity to train that. And what kind of technical situations and challenges are going on? How can we learn, recognise, and handle different issues? And what kind of tactical situation challenges are going on? Okay, that's how, no, how do we learn, recognize, and get them to handle different issues, get them to think for themselves um, and problem solve for themselves? It's often a, a, a situation in, in, in youth handball, particularly where you know, they'll, they'll ask you after two or three occasions of maybe losing one against one or failing to pick up a, set, a runner into the pivot position, or oh, what do you need to do about this? You know, and they need to get into the mindset of thinking about this kind of before, during, you know, during the duel and what was happening after. And it'll often help them problem solve in that situation. Okay, so the, I'll try to give you the answers to these in this introduction. So organizational defense skills. Okay, what we'll try to do is look at a framework that will be needed to develop skills in defense. And my understanding of the defensive game is split into these phases. What happens in advance of the situation? We talked about that. So, you know, what are we doing before the ball gets to the player? My, where in my the space I'm protecting. What happens in the situation? So, when the player receives the ball, what's what's going on? What do I need to do? What's potential for them? What happens when they're in a duel? So, the player decides to go for a one against one particularly in a 3-3 defence, this could often be the case. And then what happens after the situation? So that kind of four areas there of getting players, by training the players and getting to think along this line, in my, in, in my opinion, it helps them problem solve for themselves to realise, was the situation before the ball came here? Did I not do what I should have done? Did it happen as soon as the ball arrived? What was the problem when the duel? Was I my, my footwork wrong? Was I on the wrong side of the, the attacker? And was the problem because I didn't do anything after the ball had gone? I failed to move, etc. So they can start to look at the, the skills that they've got and when they were appropriately uh, applied. So we've got in advance of the situation. So the description of that is about movement, you no know, getting the right position at the right time. So prior to any action, they need to be thinking, right, am, am I in the right position? You no. Know, do I need to be there now? Am I late in getting there? And then more importantly, what I call standby mode, they have to be in a ready defensive position. Okay, not stood with their legs straight, you know, hands on their hips or anything, but ready to go into action. It's an an athletic stance you see it in most sports, uh, that you no, know, especially team sports. Okay, then you have the physical technical side. So it's about right. What do I need to do now that I know where I need to be to get myself in standby mode? What's the most appropriate way? Is it sideways? Do I go forward? Do I go backwards? And it's at maximum pace because it, they they need to be in that position. So sometimes sideways is not always the most appropriate way to cover the distance. If it's a one, one and a half, two metre movement, of course, maybe they can be there sideways. Any more than that, they have to turn and run to be in that position, in my opinion. And then technical, tactical 
They need to explain the situation. Where are they at? Could they explain it? Should I ask them, right, what happened there? And what could happen in the next two to three seconds? So already they, we're getting them focused on being prepared. The ball's coming. It's coming to their position. Is everything right? Are they in the right position? Um, what possibly is going to happen when the ball comes here? It's a little better getting them to think about anticipation. Okay, and then when they end up in this situation, okay, we talked before the description that you're in standby mode, so the movement, reaction, some of the skills that we talked about during that movement, and you no, know, could we intercept them? Do we could we block? Do we cut them off? Do we secure the space? Do I feint a movement? Do I press the player? Do I tackle the player? Or do I help somebody else, you know, um, because of this, what's dictated in the situation? And then the physical tactical element is about, you no, know, okay, I could intercept the pass. We could steal the, the ball. We could block shots. And that's also from the ground and from a jump. And then it's offensive and defensive blocking. So sometimes if you get players to think, okay, I'm much taller than they are in the backcourt, then it could be a defensive block. We don't need to open any space up. You know, if you're playing number three in a 3-3 defense, then absolutely most of the time is a defensive block. But the front three players could be offensive blockers. They are moving up in the space, but still using that blocking scale with the arms above the head. Close the space, okay? By closing space, sometimes we, we make them, we make them attackers make a mistake uh, or force them to make one more pass that they weren't intending to do because the space they were aiming for is no, no longer available. And then if you're, if you're controlling the space, and then you control the attackers. We said that in the earlier presentation. But if they're controlling the space, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Uh, and then slowing the pivot player. That's also the same about closing space. We know the pivot wants that space. Then if I'm closing the space and I'm making a move around, you know the taller player, we good. Uh, standby mode with the legs, you no know, shoulder width apart. The pivots need to run around you, and it slows timing and everything. And then the last parts are about securing, fainting, uh, pressing, and tackling. When we talk about feints as a defender, that's a bit again provo provoking mistakes. You may run out a step and step back, force a player to dribble it, then steal the ball. You may move one way, then the other, draw an attacker's foul, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then the technical tactical part here, again, it's about explain and solve the situation. So, you no, know, they, they've been thinking about it before it gets there. Maybe they've now got the tools to solve it. They have to think about, is it equal numbers? Okay, is it 2v2, 1v1, 3v3? Or are we superior and inferior? No, are they, are they, have they created 2v1 you know, or 3v2 situations against us? Or have we got the more players where the ball is? But all of the time, Defensive players need to you know think about that aspect because that will impact on how they they perceive what they need to do next and what skills they need to bring in. What's actually up? You know what's happening? Who's dangerous? Uh, choose the right action. Collaborate in defence. All the things we talked about before. Uh, and when will I help? You know one of the things about helping is great. One should get kids to realise that defense is a collective thing and not just an individual thing, then we sometimes get them helping too soon and opening space up. Again, but that's a development thing. They have to make that mistake many, many times before they recognize uh, what the timing looks like, what the distance and what's safe for them and when, they, when they're needed to help and build and trust in the players next to them that they could solve the problem and wouldn't need the help. And then the 360 game, talked about how your neck muscles get sore. The players need to see the whole field. It's not just I'm on the right wing and this is my little world here. They have a, in a 3-3 defence particularly, they have a whole collective. They need to know what's happening in the rest of the field. So it's having that 360 view of it and then win the ball if we can at that phase. Okay, then in the duel. Now, this is the one where I've put probably the least amount of information for, because for me, it's simply down to your your one v one skill there, but we all the other key aspects of defence training. You might not get to that part if you're good at the other things. We may have won the ball already. 
But you know, if we are in a dual situation, a 1v1, it's about the legs. First defense for me when I'm teaching young kids, it starts with your legs. You know, it's not about your upper body and tackling and being strong. They're all, of course, uh, rec- prerequisites of defense, but it starts with the legs at a younger age. Always being in balance, especially when they're in close contact. Um, and then the, when they have a, the, the duel doesn't necessarily always have to be with a player on the ball. It can also be with a player off the ball, for instance, with a pivot, you know. And again, this goes back to what you're doing before the ball's received. You know, what do you need to do? Close the space. So there's a bit of a duel there. They have to think about, is they, are they front to front or do they, has the attacker got the back to you? Because they have two different actions completely and the young players need to be aware of that. You know, that situation. And the same applies when it's a duel with a player without the ball, mainly pivots of, of the, are they front to front or back to you. So technically in this area, because we need to cut space, maybe we need to press them. And certainly we, we will at some point be tackling in this uh, dual situation. Um, you know, and uh, when I went back to, if you decide to play a 3-3 or even a 3-2-1 defense or 4-2, then this 1v1 part of your game has to be trained meticulously and constantly for the, this defence to be a success because there will be a lot more duels and a lot more 1v1 situations in such an open defence. And the idea of, the, you know, of the, the technical elements is either we make a stop in the game, I either by making a foul or we provoke a mistake. Okay, we may... You know, small foul on the arm, they may throw the ball at a play, they may hit another player on the footwear, uh, or the pass goes astray. But that's got to be the two main emphasis of it. You know, stop the game or provoke a mistake. Don't run up to make a tackle and then stop one and a half, two metres short of the attacking player and do nothing. Because that then you open space in front of you and don't cover any space behind you. And the player's still allowed to, to do as they wish. Are we all right for time, Bob? Yes, mate, we're fine. We've got uh, about eight minutes and then we've got time for questions, so you carry right. on as... as okay, well. yeah, we're, we're near the end anyway. Okay, then after the situation, the stuff that we need to consider, okay, obviously it's a new situation. Ball's been passed on, so it, it demands a new action uh, and a relocation to the next task. So your task may have gone from just being in a 1v1 duel. You've been successful. They've passed the ball off. It's a new task now. Are you available to help? Do you need to cover space somewhere else? Do you need to cover the pivot who's moved into your space, etc.? cetera? Um, the technical elements physically for that is, again, is about movement sideways, backwards, forwards, and the pace that you're running at. And then technical and tactical aspect, reposition yourself. Create a new situation and what is your new task? And, and I believe with those four areas and those four little grids, if you can work with the players and get them in that mindset, they, it will make them better problem solvers for you. They will understand defensive systems and their role within the system, irrespective of whether you play 3-3 three, three or any other type of defense, when these as- aspects are in their mindset when they're thinking about problems during the defensive situations. Okay, now going back to the 3-3 defense now. So the description that I researched and uh, and I had sort of when I've played this defense previously um, was about specific objectives for, of the defenders. So we have wing defenders here. We talked about, you know, avoid being outplayed. So strong 1v1 towards the center of the defense. Okay, not opening space up inside the number three, the central defender. Impede circulation to the wingers. Um, successfully be able to solve 2v2 situations. And then closing space in the lateral zone. Now, again, that's all about protecting that central zone. So if, you're, if you've traditionally been playing a 5-1 or a 6-0 defense, you suddenly think, oh, I, I know what, I'm going to do a 3-3 defense. The role of your wingers is completely alien if they've never played this before because suddenly now they're cooperating with probably your strongest defender and they're covering a lot more space than that two, three-meter zone on the wing they covered before. 
Okay, and they need to understand about you know what changes of opponents with the central defender means passing on the pivot, passing on a second pivot who comes into the line. Uh, front defenders. Okay, here we've got. Uh, oh, don't know what happened there. Let's go back. Sorry about that. Front defenders. That's about understanding about closing space. You no know, intervening on the players with and without the ball. Does it mean that you switch off because your player's not got the ball? If we're going back, we're thinking, right, no, what am I going to do before he receives the ball? Where should I be? Am I in the right position? That's particularly relevant with these front three defenders. They're always in movement, so they need good condition also. Read in advance any passing channels to the next player, so players that can anticipate and read that will get you a lot of turnovers with this type of defence. Uh, and intervene with your body, block the pass. So see where the danger areas are, space that opens up, where do the backs want to be attacking, get get the body in front of that, take them out of that strong area, put them in the weaker areas. And if your direct opponent runs to the line, if you're in the front, then you need to follow them and you need to keep closely marking them. So it's a completely different concept if the wing runs in. And the reason for that is if your back runs in in the back, from the back court, there's no longer anybody on that space 10 metres from goal, but they're trying to occupy a space behind you. So by running back with that player, you almost become a 4-2 defence and you cover the space that he's created as a second pivot. And all of that comes with communication, deter passes to the line even when you're at the front. So their arms are constantly up and moving. I often see young defenders defending with their arms at you no... Know, it showed our width apart, you know, and players just randomly pass ball straight over their head into a, a, an easy pass into a pivot position. That can't happen. You know, one of your jobs is to prevent those direct passes uh, to the line player from the backs and then help teammates from close positions. So we collectively defend. Although it looks like they're spread and wide, if they move appropriately into the space where the ball is, they should always be in a position where they can help their teammates. Only when they get spread so far uh, does it start to become a big 1v1 game with no help allowed. And sometimes that's what the, that's what the bigger, stronger player wants. Isolating one player, being able to play 1v1. And then finally, central defender. I think Scott Harrington referred to them as, uh, as he's kind of head doorman or something like that. But basically the commander inside the defence He's always collaborating with all the other defenders. So he's the central figure. If he, if he or she spots something, they may push you up, pull you back, move you across here, but they need to collaborate. So these, it's really important your central defender understands defense and is a good communicator. They're always close to the central area. You very, you, if, if ever, you don't want that player being dragged off the six-meter line because the space can be in front, but never behind them. Uh, and then they're masters of the 2v2 and 1v1 game because that's what they're up against constantly in this type of defence. The discouraging passes to the pivots we talked about, blocking shots we talked about, and then communication is key aspects. Of, you know, so they're the specific objectives at all the defensive positions for a 3-3 defence. So if we put that into perspective and we look at what the attacker has got in their favour. So if we have the attacker without the ball, based on the model we looked at before, we you know before, um, during the duel, uh, and after the pass, without the ball, this is before the ball comes. So they need to be control the, the direct opponent uh, and the ball. So you need to be deciding, can I be high? Could I press the player? Can I get an interception? Do I need to move to a different space? And then cover the central areas of the defence. So that's about preparing to support. When the attacker is about to receive the ball, then they can be considering things like awareness of the passing channels. Where's the ball going to come? And it, what, who's the potential receiver? And then it's about preventing, intercepting, and then control from distance. So the front players, they can control this movement way, way out from the, uh, no, from the six meter line. This is about, you no, know, as they're about to receive the ball, they can control what happens with good timing, good positioning. When they have the ball, okay, it's about harass, tackle, 
to dispossess the player, steal the ball, close, close breakthrough paths because often because there's so much space, that's the big, the big incentive for the attack to try to get into the space, beat one player one on one. And this defence has to, if they beat one player, then they have to have a second player to beat. You know, every single time it can't be once one player loses it in this defence that there's nobody there to help. And then to stop the follow and pass. Okay, so if we can do all that, stop the breakthrough, when they're trying to make a pass, you have to keep the pressure there. To stop the pass, it might not be the ball they want. It might not be able to go where they want it to go. And then blocking is a key thing when they have the ball also. So arms are aggressive and up all of the time. And then after they've just made the pass, it's about control the direct opponent again. So we're back to where they are without the ball and cover the defensive space. Decrease distance between defenders and reduce the depth. So it's all about, you know, you can start to squeeze it in where the ball is all of the time. And then it just repeats again. It's the same cycle. Okay. And thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Bill. Um, really, really cool presentation. And um, yeah, a lot of detail in there for, for our uh, colleagues to take away with them. Um, I'll kick off with a question if that's okay. So, and I know you'll, you'll have an opinion on this. So, yep. when we you broke it down into those roles a moment ago and the, the objectives for each role, but how would you decide, let's take, for example, um, not necessarily a beginner player, but players that might be progressing through our regional academy system. So they might be 14, 15 years old, um, training with, with you once, once a month um, in our competition program. How would you decide which player takes which roles? Is there any rationale for that? Would you change, let them change positions, experience? And, you know, the yeah, I, I, well, you just answered the question there at the end, Bob. I, I think, you know, when, when I said this is an ideal defence for juniors, it's also an ideal defence for them to play many positions. So, I mean, effectively, there's two lines of defence, there's front and back. Uh, and really, for me, at that age group, then they play everywhere. You know, let's see the quality. Sometimes we don't see the quality. It's not always evident how well players read the game or read interceptions. I particularly noticed it with the girls because, you know, the, the skills that they bring from netball often make them very good front defenders. You know, defenders who can win the ball and pressure the ball and pressure the player before the ball gets there. But if you play them in the back three, that's not always evident. Sure. Um, and how might that kind of then change? So let's say, for example, you were going to go, you know, you were away with the GB U19 uh, girls. Yep. And let's say you were three games into the tournament that you were playing, your defensive setup that you were using initially isn't working, you decide to change. How would you kind of, um, yeah, then decide who plays, who plays where? Uh, well, I think, no, if we were to, no, did, if we were to play, a 3-3 three, three defence at any particular point. Uh, it would be something that would be planned before I go in there. And it would also be something, if I'm playing a 3-3, three, three, that's it'll be because I need the ball. It'll be because we're behind. So what will shape where I play players will be two factors. No, if, no, if there's a strong pivot player, I'll look at three at the back who can you know, manage that situation for me. I'm, I'll happily take shots from the wing if I have to. But when I'm shaping the three at the front, I'll look for speed because I'll be wary of the counter-attack. Uh, it's the reason why we're doing it. And, and I would want players that can help us there that I don't have to be making changes, you know, taking one player off, put another on. Or the playmaker playing at the front, having to wait because she wants to take the ball on the second wave and we lose all momentum in the front players. So that, that would be you know, how I would shape that. Cool. Okay, I think there's another question that's just come into the chat box. Yeah. Carla. Um, so it's, it's a bit more related to the system and how you see uh, the position of the players. And the question is, um, how far would you ask your three, say, point defenders in this case to, to go uh, in, in distance? Yeah, I think, you know, Earlier in the presentation, I said that it's often a question, and it is often a question from coaches as well, young coaches, that, oh, how far do we go on a 3-3? Three, three? Uh, there's no real answer to that. I could say 10 metres, and then they have a player who can score from 11 metres. I could say, you know, 
nine meters and you no know, it'll all be dependent on you know what your objective is if you set the three three up to uh in particular stop the team scoring or if you set your three three up to win the ball back it'll have two different you know if you're playing against a particularly weak team uh then normally the the players themselves tend to go higher because they're hungry they sense they can smell blood and they can get they feel they can get the ball so they'll push up and up and up if they're a little bit nervous about the backcourt players they'll not play so high and maybe you want them to play high but yeah. i wouldn't draw a line on the court but one thing i would advise if you're playing 3-3 three, three, that you don't have them as a triangle because it's not a 3-2-1 it's a completely different defense. If all three have to be playing in a line, when one moves up, the rest move up. One moves back, the rest move back. They have to work in you no know, collaboration constantly. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I feel, I feel like a doctor out of that one there. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy is thanking you for you for your reply. There's another question in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, which is Richard is saying he's thinking about implementing this uh, into a training session. Uh, scenario not necessarily a game yet um so do you think the fact that if if just by applying it to a to a training scenario not to a game could be counterproducive to the development of the players yeah uh, no, on, on squad. no uh, yeah absolutely i, I mean in, a, lot, a while back uh, when I, I was teaching mini handball under 14s if you like um we used it as a training method where the front three were not allowed inside nine meters and the back, the back three were not allowed outside nine meters. So it kind of gave them the kind of spatial awareness, the movement, you know, what they had to do, how they had to problem solve. And, you know, I, I think, you no know, creative restrictions like that are good, but, you no know, keeping the basic principles of it, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't begin to look like a three to one. If you're going to use it as a training method, as a three three, it has to be two banks of three working together. Uh, and then, because the key thing with this defense is collaboration. You know, sometimes in a three to one, collaboration is very important, but the front player in a three to one is, uh, is a key player at dictating where they have to be in the point of this triangle all of the time. In a three three, it doesn't operate like that. Yeah. Um... There's thank you, Ricardo, Richard. Thanks for your for your answer. And there's another question uh, in terms of videos, but I guess we'll share that on the post session email. Any resources on that front? Bobby wants to. Bobby's raising his pen. Yeah, so I've got a question, uh, and it's around goalkeeping, Bill. So, um, what kind of um, opportunities or risks does this defence have for for goalkeepers and and their I suppose because you're talking about younger players their long term yeah. development. Yeah, I think you no know, you, you need to be realistic with the goalkeepers um, because this kind of defence can destroy a goalkeeper's confidence because if it's not played well they will take a lot of shots from six meters in the high percentage area where you no know, we know that okay maybe getting two from 10 is a success rate for the goalkeeper, but it's not a success rate in their eyes if it's constant. So you, you need to be careful with the young goalkeepers here that they understand that, okay, we're going to play this defense and what we're going to try and do is make them shoot from here. You know, uh, I think if, if you find that you've got a young goalkeeper who's really good on the wing positions, this is an excellent defence for them to work with because you can play to their strengths by you no know, and and then the the defence themselves will gain confidence of covering the middle zone, knowing that the goalkeeper does such a good job in the in the pivot position, uh, sorry, on the wing position. But I mean, don't be you no. Know, I've saw many young goalkeepers destroyed, confidence destroyed with this defence, and uh, you know it it can't be the only purpose for that goalkeeper is to say one breakthrough that hit, the ball comes off them, hits the roof and everybody celebrates because in the meantime he's let another nine in past that, you know, they need to if, if they're going to play this type of defence, they need to train appropriately, there'll be less nine metre shots in this defence and more uh, from six, seven, eight metres Thanks mate um, uh, Go on then, Ricardo 
No, you're going to carry on with another question? No, I'm just going to go to Gonzalo's one. Ah, go on then. You want to make it yourself? Sure. So, um, Gonzalo, who you know, Bill, was asking a question about um, dealing with the player from the second line. I think you did mention about it in the presentation. Yeah. Um, but do you recommend changing or swapping the, the, the players um, so they can follow their own attacker? Um, I, th I think with this defence that you have a problem because, well, I think with most defences, even if I was talking 3-2-1 three, three, defence here, if the if the attack by just throwing in a second line player causes you to change your system, they've got the upper hand. So if you three three is if three three is successful for you and they're beginning to send in second line players, in my opinion with this defense, if the wing runs in, then they need to be the winger doesn't run with them, but they pass them across and then they support the central defender to cover the other pivot. So both wing defenders are tucking in tight and people might say to me yeah but what if both of the pivot players move a little bit more centrally well the, the closer you can get them to the central defender the better so don't be nervous about that the, the danger is when the pivots are wider from each other because then this central defender has a lot of running to do between both pivots if the wing defender doesn't come and help with that wide position pivot if the second pivot runs from any of the three backcourt positions, we are three-three defence. That player has to go with them, uh, and then it almost then will look like a four-two. Then when they pop back out, go back to your three-three because there's no point in keeping a player out there protecting space with nobody in it. Cool. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so there's one more question. Do you use that defence because you have the same defence projects on national adults team? So um, I think that the, well, the question here actually is like, we're not, this is just a proposal for the defence. This is not uh, us saying to use the defence. It's not, it's not um, a system that we're advocating uh, above all, all others. Um, mm -hmm. And, we'd, and um, as far as I'm aware, we're not using that in our senior national teams. Ricardo? No. Uh, no, no, we're not. We use three, two, one, six, zero, and five, one. Uh, three, three is part of our blueprint, uh, part of the systems that we would like our young players to learn, just because it improves them individually at earlier stages and gives them the notion of communication and cooperation and, and, and improves their individual defensive technique. But it's not a system that we're using at an adult level now. And I, th I think from, from me for the the under-19 girls team, you know, it's, it's not a defence I would use unless, like I say, I'm chasing the game. Um, but it does have its value in terms of developing and helping, particularly a defence like a, a 3-2-1, you know, because, you know, we, we can see players who move well. But, I mean, the whole objective of the presentation wasn't about saying that 3-3 three, three is a bad defence or saying that 3-3 three, three is a good defence. Any defence has its its strengths and weaknesses. But it was about, I, I felt I could take the opportunity to look at how you can help your young players understand defence better, whether it's a 3-3, three, three, the player, or a 6-0. You know, everything is the same. If you get them in the right mindset, they can solve the problem no matter what the situation is, whether they're open defence or closed defence. Brilliant. Thanks, Bill. Thank um, guys, I'm going to take this opportunity to wrap up the webinar. Thank you so much for engaging with us. Some really good questions towards the end there and, and fantastic stuff from you, Bill. Thanks for taking the time out this afternoon to join us. Um, we are back next week, Wednesday. We have uh, 7v6. Ricardo, who's presenting for us? Carlos Martindo, the assistant coach from FC Porto and Portuguese uh, under-18 men's head coach. So a really interesting one with this, uh, this new concept of uh, attacking uh, principles in handball. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. And uh, guys, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, Bill.